This is Scott from kstacks.com. In this video, Dr. West will review cranial nerve anatomy on MRI. We'll start with cranial nerve 1. And to see cranial nerve 1, we're going to look into the anterior cranial fossa. And here you have along the anterior medial frontal lobe what is known as the gyrus rectus here. And immediately inferior to that, you have the olfactory groove. And in this olfactory groove lives cranial nerve number one, the olfactory nerve. And here's your olfactory bulb here. With the more posterior course of the olfactory tract, not well visualized at this resolution of imaging. This nerve sits immediately above the cribriform plate, which is better visualized by CT, and is responsible, as you know, for the sense of smell. Then we're going to go to the second cranial nerve, the optic nerve. We're going to actually start with the optic tracts. It can be seen here as a hypo-intense or dark structure extending through the CSF on the left and the right. These are going to come together to form the optic chiasm immediately anterior to the inferior aspect of the hypothalamus and the adjacent pituitary stalk or infundibulum. Then the optic nerves will continue anteriorly as the cisternal segment of the optic nerve for a short distance as demonstrated here. In this segment, they are surrounded by CSF. These nerves then pass through the optic canal, which is the structure here. This hypo-intense region is actually the optic nerve, the intracanalicular course of the nerve, and that is immediately anterior medial to the anterior clinoid process demonstrated here. Once the optic nerve passes through the optic canal, it becomes the intraorbital segment of the optic nerve, which travels in the optic nerve sheath anteriorly. The short segment of the optic nerve as it inserts on the posterior globe is known as the intraocular segment. Next we'll move to the oculomotor nerve or cranial nerve three. Here we are at the level of the midbrain. Here we can see this hyperintense structure, the solene aqueduct, which connects the third and fourth ventricles. This is your right cerebral peduncle. This is your left cerebral peduncle. This CSF here is called the interpeduncular cistern. And within the interpeduncular cistern, you can see these ocular motor nerve exiting and traveling through the CSF anteriorly and laterally into this small dural outpouching which contains CSF which is known as the oculomotor cistern. The nerve then continues anteriorly along the superior lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, then exits into the orbit through the superior orbital fissure, innervating all the extraocular musculature except for the lateral rectus and superior oblique muscles. We can use the inferior colliculi demonstrated here as a landmark for the nucleus of the trochlear nucleus which is, like the oculomotor nerve, located immediately ventral to the sylvian aqueduct in a location caudal to the oculomotor nuclei. From the level of the trochlear nucleus, the central course of the trochlear nerve extends posteriorly and inferiorly, decusating or crossing in a structure known as the superior medullary vellum. It then will exit the contralateral dorsal brainstem, seen here, and course anteriorly and laterally within the ambient cistern 
to travel along the margin of the free edge of the tentorium demonstrated here. The trochlear nerve is unique in that it is the only nerve that decussates in its entirety and the only nerve that exits from the dorsal brainstem. The trochlear nerve will then exit into the cavernous sinus immediately inferior to cranial nerve 3 and travel anteriorly along the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, also exiting the superior orbital fissure into the orbit and innervating the superior oblique muscle. The trochlea is present along the course of the superior oblique muscle. Which is demonstrated here, the superior oblique muscle travels anteriorly along the superior medial margin of the orbit and then passes through a trochlea or ring-like structure that serves as a pulley turning laterally to insert on the superior margin of the globe. So we're going to move on to the trigeminal nerve. We are at the level of the mid-pons. You can see the prepontine cistern, the basilar artery, the pons proper, the superior cerebellar peduncles, and the superior aspect of the fourth ventricle. The trigeminal nerve root exit site is along the lateral margin of the mid-pons right here. It travels anteriorly through the prepontine cistern as the cisternal segment. The cisternal segment of the trigeminal nerve will subsequently pass through the porous trigeminus, or opening to Meckel's cave, entering the Caesarean or trigeminal ganglion along the inferior aspect of Meckel's cave. Then the trigeminal nerve is going to split into three divisions. The first division is going to extend anteriorly into the cavernous sinus along the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus slightly inferior to um, cranial nerve 4. This is known as the first division of the trigeminal nerve or ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. It also is going to travel anteriorly and exit through the superior orbital fissure into the orbit. The second division of the trigeminal nerve is known as the maxillary division. This nerve, demonstrated well here, passes through foramen called the foramen rotundum, pictured here. The foramen rotundum gets its name from its appearance on coronal imaging where it is round. So after the maxillary division of the cranial nerve passes through the foramen rotundum. It is now located in the pterygo palatum fossa demonstrated here. At this point it will give two branches which will go to the pterygo palatine ganglion and then continue as the infraorbital nerve entering the infraorbital canal along the orbital floor and traveling anteriorly exiting the infraorbital foramen and supplying sensory innervation to the overlying cheek and maxillary teeth. The third division of the trigeminal nerve or mandibular nerve does not enter the cavernous sinus. Instead, extending inferiorly, exiting the skull base at this foramen, which is known as foramen oval, into the masticator space, innervating several of the muscles of mastication, as well as other structures. Note that the bone, as can be seen with the sphenoid wing here, is 
relatively hyper intense on this cis sequence with the cortical bone and sutures being hypo intense. There is a helpful landmark to identify the nucleus of the sixth cranial nerve. We are now at the level of the mid pons. This is your middle cerebellar peduncle, your vermis of the cerebellum, and your fourth ventricle. There are two bumps on the posterior margin of the pons at this level, which are called the facial colliculi. These serve as good markers for identification of the abdicens nuclei, which live in a paramedium location immediately ventral to the facial colliculi. The central course of the abdicens nerve then extends anteriorly and inferiorly to the pontomedullary junction ventrally. So here we are with at the level of the pons going inferiorly to the level of the medulla. So it's at this juncture of the medulla and the pons that I look for the exit of the abdicens nerve, which I can see right here at the tip of my cursor. And you can follow that up anteriorly and superiorly along the cisternal segment of the abdicens nerve, which then enters a canal surrounded by a tiny amount of CSF, known as the Rellos Canal. We then lose good visualization of the cranial nerve by this sequence. However, we do know that it passes anteriorly through the cavernous sinus, while cranial nerves 3, 4, and the ophthalmic maxillary divisions of the fifth cranial nerve pass along the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Cranial nerve six actually passes through the cavernous sinus proper, the only cranial nerve to do so. It also exits into the orbit through the superior orbital fissure and innervates the lateral rectus muscle. The facial motor nucleus is in approximately this location, extending posteriorly and wrapping around the abdicens nucleus at the level of the facial colliculus and then extending laterally to exit into the cisternal segment at this location. This nerve continues laterally into the internal auditory canal. This portion of the cranial nerve is known as the intracanalicular segment. This extends anteriorly along the superior aspect of the IAC to the lateral margin of the IAC or IAC fundus with the facial nerve then exiting into the osseous segment of the temporal bone. The intratemporal course of the facial nerve is best visualized on a CT examination. Here we are on a zoomed view of the left temporal bone here with the internal auditory canal, the porous acousticus, the IAC fundus, or lateral aspect of the internal auditory canal, the vestibular apparatus, the cochlea. At the IAC fundus, the facial nerve enters the temporal bone as the labyrinthine segment, extending along a short course to the geniculate ganglion, where a sharp bend occurs and the facial nerve continues posteriorly and laterally in a horizontal fashion
as the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. Posteriorly, the facial nerve turns in an inferior direction, extends inferiorly, intimately associated with the mastoid segment of the temporal bone as the mastoid segment of the facial nerve, extending inferiorly and exiting the skull base at the stylomastoid foramen, named for the styloid process demonstrated here and the mastoid temporal bone. The vestibulocochlear nerve or cranial nerve 8 exits the brainstem here into its external segment. The cochlear nuclei are located here, immediately ventral to the foramen of Lushka. In fact, when implanting auditory brainstem implants, the leads for these implants are placed through the foramen of Lushka to stimulate the cochlear nerve nuclei. The vestibulocochlear nerve exits the brainstem in this location and extends anterolaterally. At this location, the cisternal segment of the vestibulocochlear nerve divides into the cochlear, superior, and inferior vestibular nerves, with the cochlear nerve extending anteriorly through the cochlear aperture into the cochlea. The vestibular nerves are present more posteriorly within the internal auditory canal with the superior vestibular nerve demonstrated here and the inferior vestibular nerve demonstrated here. Cranial nerve 9, the glossopharyngeal nerve, exits the medulla in the post olivary sulcus. Extending laterally to exit the skull base through the pars nervosa of the jugular foramen. The vagus nerve or cranial nerve number 10 exits the medulla at the level of the post olivary sulcus, extending laterally along its external course, immediately inferior to the glossopharyngeal nerve, exiting through the pars vascularis of the jugular foramen. For the spinal accessory nerve, we go down to the region of the foramen magnum, even to the level of C1. And here we have the spinal cord, and we have this nerve that's going to extend superiorly and laterally through the foramen magnum. in exiting the skull base within the pars vascularis of the jugular foramen. Immediately inferior to the level of the vagus nerve are bulbar contributions to the spinal accessory nerve likely identified here. These are going to join the spinal component of the spinal accessory nerve demonstrated here. The hypoglossal nerve exits the medulla in the pre-olivary sulcus, extending laterally 
to exit the skull base through the hypoglossal canal demonstrated here.